Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company, a nationally ranked community-focused bank with over 30 locations throughout Virginia, Northeast Tennessee, and North Carolina. Who you choose to bank with can make all the difference. Visit firstbank.com to learn more. Happy Valentine's Day, Hokie Nation. We got a great show for you as we're talking men's and women's basketball, and we got some football news as well. It's all on tap. Episode 347 of the Tech Sideline podcast starts right now. record on Wednesday, February 14th, 2024, from our studio at the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center. Remember to like, subscribe, or refer the show to a friend, and head over to techsideline.com to check out our extensive editorial content. As always, the first month of subscriptions is free. I'm your host, Giovanni Heater. Across the way, our managing editor, Mr. David Cunningham. To my right, Chris Coleman, our lead analyst and columnist. In the fourth chair today, our senior staff writer, Andy Bitter. And behind the scenes, producing the mustache man himself, Mr. Nick Brown. Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. The Tech Sideline podcast is also brought to you by Coldwell Banker Townside Realtors. Trusted real estate services for the Roanoke and New River Valleys of Virginia. If you're in the market to purchase or sell a residential property, or if you're looking for land or investment property in Southwest Virginia, we have you covered. With three offices in the area, we serve Blacksburg, Christiansburg, Radford, Roanoke, Salem, Vinton, Smith Mountain Lake, and all of the surrounding areas. Visit cbtownside.com to learn more. All right, fellas, let's uh, jump right into our football content to get things going. Coaching contracts have been extended, all position coaches through 2026, coordinators through 2027. Wanted to get Chris and Andy's thoughts and have you guys kind of explain to everybody uh, the breakdown here because you kind of see the headline, Chris Marv and Tyler Bowen and all these guys extended, but explain uh, the reasons as to why and how the position coaches were also having their contracts up at this point. Uh, first of all, I, I, I want to note that two years ago when Brent Pry was originally hired, his assistant coaches were making 5.225 million total two years later they are making 5.325 million so there's only a very very slight increase uh joe rudolph made so much money he made 750 725 thousand dollars when he was at tech and ron crook his replacement makes uh he'll be making 490 this year um Rudolph's being on the staff really threw the whole salary thing out of balance. Um, everything's streamlined now. You know the regular assistants are on two-year deals, and their and their contracts ex- expire at the end of 2026. The three coordinators, and remember that that includes Stu Holt, the special teams coordinator, they have three-year contracts through March of 2027. Um, I know this seems like a lot of money to to a lot of tech fans but you know tech is like what fifth in the acc or something like that in coaching staff salaries this is normal par for the core stuff in 2024 um so uh i think this is uh some of the some of these coaches contracts you know they had to be extended because they actually expired if if, at the beginning of this year so the only thing you can nitpick is three-year deals for the coordinators but, but again, like it's it's not that's not uncommon these days. And when it comes down to it, I th- again, I think tech is I think there are four or five ACC schools whose coordinators make more than than, than techs. So tech is upper middle of the pack or at the bottom of the top, however you want to <laughs> phrase it. So like tech is not making, you know, they're not paying out exorbitant salaries. This is par for the course if you want to be a competitive uh program uh, these days in 2024 uh, you know and I, and I also think they didn't have to extend the coordinators because they had they had one more year left on their contract but I, and they also didn't need to extend like uh, Elijah Brooks and Ron Crook because I think they still had another year left on their contract since they came in after prize first year but I think they wanted to get everything streamlined and I, I think by making an announcement the way they made it, it's like, okay, here's everybody's contracts. E- everybody either got an extension or a very, very, very small bump in pay. So you can announce it as entire Virginia Tech coaching staff receives extension, which really isn't true. But but uh, 
but that's the way it comes across. And I think that's a little bit to capitalize on the momentum at the end of uh, last year for recruiting purposes. Yeah, I, I think you look at it, and as you mentioned, some of the contracts were up on January 1st, so they had to do something about it. Uh, you extended a couple years like this, you at least give the impression to recruits these guys are going to be around for a while, and maybe recruits are smart enough to see through that and go that these guys change around all the time. No changes to the staff this year, but that, that's sort of uncommon to have the entire staff back after a season. Uh, it lines everything up again, uh, three years out for the coordinators, two years for the uh, all the position coaches. Uh, modest bumps, I think when you look at it all, in total, it was like 4.6% raise across the board for the entire staff, uh, keeping up with inflation, I guess, at this at this point. I mean, it's, it's not like they broke the bank with this whole thing. I thought one of the interesting things they did was they added uh, uh, retention bonuses for the staff. Previously, I think only Fontel Mines had that in place. After last year when Penn State showed some interest, they redid his deal, uh, had uh, retention bonuses for three years out. I think he gets one this year for 25000 now, basically every coach on the staff uh, has a retention bonus in place if they're here next March. And I think with Bowen and uh, Marv, and if they're here the following March, another 50000 on top of that. So, you know, trying to incentivize keeping these guys together, I think that's a smart thing. And, you know, after they how the, the team finished last year and the you know the forward momentum it felt like in the program i think it's it's probably a good thing that they lock these guys up and, and keep everybody in place and you know continuity is a big thing you'll hear about with the Hokies next year whether it's continuity of the roster the lineup uh play calling uh, just the operation to have the entire coaching staff coming back like that uh after the shakeup they had last year with Bowen leaving and you know Brad Glenn leaving i, I think they like what they have in place Certainly some positive momentum in the football side of things. Uh, some more positive momentum that Andy had brought up for us. The SP Plus rankings, formerly known as SMP Plus rankings, uh, are now out. Hokies finished 46th at the end of this past bowl season. Preseason last year, they were 72. This year preseason, they're now 30th in the country. Quite the jump, Andy. Yeah, I like these. These rankings are my favorite in the offseason because they take an analytical approach to thing. And people are going to argue about like, oh, you're including recruiting classes or past production and all this stuff. This is these are meant to be predictive and it's a formula that goes into it. So, you know, if you're ahead of this team, you should be favored against that team. Uh, you know, there's there's point totals that are associated with everything. So it's not straight up if you're ahead of them, you're favored. But, you know, you, you consider to be better than them on this thing. And, you know, it's measured in efficiency and how you perform form during the season i think they take out garbage time and a lot of other stuff that would affect stats uh so it's a real analytical look at how this is it's not just like oh here's my top 25 i'm i'm really feeling this team and you know certain biases leak in when it's like that so i, I look at this and i see 30th i mean that's as high as virginia tech's been in a while uh you know, i can't remember all the rankings over the years maybe you have to go back to 2017 probably 2017 if I had to yeah, guess. and you know that wasn't a great team. It was a pretty good team that beat all the teams it should have and lost all the teams it should have uh, during that season. But it's been a while since Virginia Tech's sort of had this kind of outlook in the off season. And I look at this, and there are seven uh, ACC teams in the top thirty. Uh, you know, I originally tweeted this out. I said six. I forgot SMU is now an ACC team, <laughs> one of 17 ACC teams. I think people were getting on us for saying the wrong number of teams in the last podcast. Uh, but Florida State, Clemson, Miami, Louisville, NC State, Virginia Tech, SMU, all in the top 30. I mean, that's a pretty competitive league right there when you look at the outlook of some of these schools. Uh, and for Virginia Tech to be in that that upper tier with those groups in the top 30, I, you know, I think that's, again, this program trending in the right direction. And is there, of those seven teams in the top 30, is there one team that is, like, completely way ahead of the others? It's not Florida State's 12th. They're, right. Uh, yeah, right. Clemson 16th, Miami 21st. I'm sure people have opinions about that one. Uh, Louisville 24th, <laughs> SMU 27th, Virginia Tech 30th, NC State 28th. Right. So um, it's not like so there's only not eight, like you're chasing Georgia. Right. You so know? there's only an 18 spot difference between Florida State and Virginia Tech. Right. Yeah. So uh, and Florida State had a great year last year, but they lost a ton. Right. They lost a ton. Um, they got a lot of Alabama transfers, so we'll see. I don't know how much the factors that type of, of recruiting in. Um, Clemson, still a very, very good program, but not quite dominant Clemson like they used to be. So, uh, I, I'm, you know, I think Florida State or Clemson will probably win the ACC 
this year. It's the most likely outcome. But at the same time, it's not so so much set in stone that that there's like there's not a national title contender and then everybody else. Well, I mean, there were you know six seven straight years there where it was Clemson that was just out ahead of the pack, and, it, and you know Florida State I guess popped in there every now and forgetting when and Florida State went on a skid there for a while. But there were t- years you go into the season just be like, you know, Clemson is you know minus 1000 to win the ACC or something like that. Like it's a you know very heavy favor to do that. I don't think it's going to be like that this year. Uh, so, you know, for Virginia tech to at least be in that sort of upper echelon of schools is very interesting. Another thing, I mean, you can you take some of these point totals that they have on this and you can probably figure out what the point spreads are going to be on these games. Uh, and tech probably, if you look at the schedule right now, would be favored in 10 of its 12 games would be an underdog against Miami at Miami would be an underdog at home against Clemson. And that's it. That's crazy. Uh, you know, slight favorite against Rutgers. I think Rutgers is actually one of the tougher games yeah. on the schedule that they have there, in, in, at least in terms of this, when you're looking at uh, SP Plus. So, you know, you, you, you ask all these people, we're going to have a survey out, uh, a fan survey out for, about football on the site here shortly. I'm not sure exactly when, but, you know, going to ask one of the questions could be how many games is Virginia Tech going to win this year? I feel like it's going to be a very high total to fan. I think they're going to be very excited about this team. And I, again, I'd say enjoy it because it's been a while since they've actually had this sort of, you know, off season expectations and enjoyment going into the, you know, the off season. Like yeah. This. And you talk about the games where tech is going to be underdogs as of right now. One of those games is at Miami. I feel com- pretty comfortable with being an underdog. It's not, at Miami. It's not the hornet's nest going down there. No, like if you catch it, them at the right time, know, or like they just lose a big game. Tech like could lose Miami that game. folds like no team. Tech in the country. could lose that game easily, but they could also win it by twenty. You just don't. What Miami team is going to show up? And it's being not a crowd that'll scare you, either. right? Right. And Tech is would be a home dog to Clemson. You kind of like that role where uh, I don't think there's too much separating the the two teams. Well, you gotta um, like but, it. You, you look on the other side, and the quarterback's Kate Klubnik as opposed to Trevor Lawrence or Deshaun Watson or some of those guys who are just like, okay, they could take over this game. And these are like, you know, NFL guys now that are, that are stars in the NFL. So uh, I don't think they have that. And if they don't have that, they don't necessarily scare you as much, even though I think that defense could be great. And, you know, I, I I think Dabo is still a good coach, even though he probably would be, it would behoove him to embrace the transfer portal a bit more than he has here. And that program is not going away, but it's not like, all caps Clemson like it has been in the past. David, I know you have something for us over there. Chris, how many times since 2010 do you think Virginia Tech has started 3-0? and Just period, overall. <laughs> Andy, you can chime in too if you want. How many? How, the, the reason I bring this up is because Virginia Tech's uh, – Doug Bowman of 247 tweeted this out. Uh, Virginia Tech's offense will open the year against the following defenses. Vanderbilt, 115. Marshall, 105. Old Dominion, 110. Virginia, in, 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 since 2010, Andy, Chris, I'll how many times do you think Virginia Tech has started 3-0 overall? I'll say twice. Once. It is, it is twice. It was once in 2011. 2011. And once in 2017. 17, okay. Then Those are the only two times Virginia Tech has started 3-0. And that Rutgers game, like Andy said, is that's a really good team. But if Tech can get off to a really, really good start, that kind of puts you in a, in a good position once you head into that you know big stretch, Rutgers, Miami, Stanford, you know, into Octo- into the kind of the depths of October. But we haven't really seen a, a Tech team get off to a, a really, really good start like that in a while. Virginia Tech versus Rutgers in the first really big game of the season. Just like we all, <laughs> back in the Big East days, just like we all thought it would be. That's assuming a lot with Virginia Tech. I mean, yeah, we've seen Virginia enough. Tech over the years, <laughs> and you go, oh, they should beat this team, and then they don't in certain games. It's like, yeah, I, I've tweeted before. I think if they don't go four and zero, it would be a disappointment, just based on the expectations of the fans and sort of where this program was trending last year. I'm not saying I think that's likely that they go four and zero, and I know the math of it. You, you, you know, you're not going to win every game that you're favored in. But man, you look at those first three games. I mean, Vanderbilt, worst team in the SEC. Uh, it's Marshall old yeah. week two. Yeah. Uh, you know, Marshall at home losing uh, their star running back from last year. A game last year, I think a lot of Hokies fans look at it and go, man, they lost that game. How'd they lose that game on the road with the way they played? And then at ODU, which I know the history at ODU, and that'll be the, the thing that you bring up is like, you know, whatever favorite you are, bad things seem to happen whenever you go down there. That's a team you should beat, and you should beat soundly if you're a good team. So, uh, 
it'll be interesting to watch because there's finally some expectations on this team to do a little bit better than they have in the past, and we'll see if they live up to them. No doubt we're going to continue that conversation literally until the football season starts and then some, so can't wait to keep talking about it. But for now, let's flip the script and talk about this unbelievable women's basketball team right now, winners of seven in a row. Uh, The Hokies are just unstoppable, it feels like, at this point, coming off wins over NC State on the road, took down number three Wolfpack in Reynolds Coliseum, won there for just the second time in program history. The first time was a year ago around this time, and then coming off a a Sunday win uh, inside Castle against Boston College. David, what is going so right for this team at this particular moment in time? It helps when you got two All-Americans. Um, I think, first of all, Elizabeth and Kitley and Georgia Amor are, are playing fantastic basketball right now. Since Amor came back from that head injury, that that was kind of the her, – her first game back was, I believe, the second game in Tech's win streak. She missed the, the first game against Clemson. She, she's playing with the better pace, with the better feel. Elizabeth Kitley has been terrific. She had that one game up in Syracuse where she did not shoot the ball great. Other than that, there have been some games where she's even been lights out. Um, she hasn't been quite perfect, but but she's been awfully good. And, you know, she's back-to-back AC Player of the Week. So I think that kind of, you know, tells the story itself. Um, but I think the most imp- the two most important things, or I should say three most important things, Virginia Tech's playing terrific defense. The Massey ratings have Tech as the 13th best defense in the country. Tech is playing very, very well in that end, even if Courtney Banghart won't say that. Um, <laughs> and I think part of that is Kitley is is a terrific shot blocker, and she's such a, a force down there. Kayla King is staying on the floor more, is not getting into as much foul trouble. Uh, and I think the players that are coming in, who I want to talk about in a sec, are, are coming in and playing really, really well. The second part is rebounding. Olivia Sumio and Clara Strack have been terrific on the boards, and this is the best Virginia Tech rebounding team since the Hokies have been in the ACC ever. Um, Tech had a team in 2013-14, I believe, that that was a really good rebounding team, and uh, Kenny Brooks' team in 2019-20 that had Elizabeth Kitley as a freshman, Lydia Rivers, uh, Trinity Baptiste, some really good rebounders there. But this is by far and away the best team rebounding. Part of that is Kitley. Part of that is... Olivia Sumiel has been terrific. Her positioning, her ability to react to where the ball is going and kind of read it and, and get to that spot. And then Claire Strack, she's only a true freshman, but she's come in and she's rebounded the ball tremendously. Virginia Tech has been terrific on the offensive glass, which has helped Tech get a ton of uh, extra chances. I think the most pivotal stretch in that NC State game, the most pivotal play, there was a possession where Claire Strack got two offensive rebounds, and it ended up resulting in a Kayla King three. It's the ability to give yourself extra chances with the basketball. Um, And the third thing is, along those same lines, Strack and some of y'all, and even somebody like Carly Wenzel and Karis Baker when she comes in, Tech's getting contributions from everybody. And um, I think somebody like Matilda Eck, somebody like Kayla King, they probably need to be a little bit more consistent. But when they can go 8 of 20 from behind the arc down at NC State, that'll help you win a lot of basketball games. She's kind of, Olivia Samuel's kind of been like uh, Rodman in the last dance when he's talking about the rebound. He's like, <laughs> coming out this way. She's I wonder down how everywhere. she would feel about being compared to Dennis Rodman. That's a, that's a, that's, I think he's that's a favorite, compliment as far as a rebounder player goes. Of all time. So for me, it would be a compliment, but not everybody would feel that way. I, I, I've only got two things to add to that. Uh, and one of them we talked about last week, Kenny Brooks has figured out his rotation, especially at the four. The other thing is like this team, not necessarily everybody on the team, but the, the key pieces on this team they've been here before like K- kenny brooks learned how to coach in this situation last year kitley king georgia more a more they all played in this exact situation last year so there's experience it's kind of like uh the first time you go to the super bowl you usually lose right brock purdy but you get experience and then the next time you go you probably win um so i'm not saying they're gonna win the national title and go back to the final four but Being in this situation, again, for the second year in a row, the experience factor helps, I think. Yeah, no doubt. Andy, you've been watching and tuning in on uh, the women's team as well. Yeah, I'm curious. I'll ask David, what does this team need to do to be ranked in the top ten? I because, think, like, how many times, <laughs> how, like, if they beat NC State two more times, would they finally pass <laughs> NC State? I, I don't understand how NC State is still ranked sixth. Yeah. And the Hokies are 12th. I think the tough part is that, um, and it's a very similar thing to last year. If you look at what Virginia Tech's resume was at this point last year, it was almost the exact same. 
And eventually Tech ended up jumping into the top 10 when it you know, continued it, its crazy stretch of games. The, the top 10, in some ways it makes sense, in some ways it confuses me. Um, the top 10 didn't even change this week. And there were like three or four teams in the top 10 that lost, but they all just moved up and down. Three teams stayed the same. South Carolina at the top and then you, you, uh, UCLA and USC at 9 and 10. Iowa lost. NC State lost to Tech, Colorado lost two, three, four, and they all dropped like two, three, four spots. Um, I, I, it, it doesn't really make a ton of sense, but at the same time, you look at Tech's net rank, ranking, and Tech doesn't necessarily have as many quadrant, or I don't, it's not quadrants, as many you know top twenty-five technically victories as some of the other teams. Um, I think with the AP voters, there's always that human element to it, right? And I think. You look at a team like NC State, NC State has three losses, and both are to Virginia Tech, and the other one's to Miami, um, but has wins over UConn and Colorado, and those carry weight. Um, I think Tech should be be ranked probably around 10, but if, if you're Tech, you just got to keep taking care of business, and... Uh, I think eventually the results will speak for itself. I mean, this is a big week coming up. Duke on Thursday, Louisville on the road on Sunday, uh, and, and teams will continue to, to fall. But it is funny because it's every single, you know, a, a, after beating NC State again, it's like, oh, where's Virginia Tech ranked? Tech only jumped up, okay, four spots. That was the biggest jump in the poll. But NC State is still like sixth or seventh, uh, I think sixth in, in the country. And it's like Tech's beat them twice. So it, it's – and it's not something that is – just unique to Virginia Tech. Um, gosh, I saw, I don't remember who, but I saw somebody else talking about a very similar situation where it's like a team that, uh, one team that beat another school, one team that beat another school twice is, is behind them in the poll. And that just happens. Um, but I think the, the biggest thing is Tech's in a good position when it comes to the NCAA tournament. And if Tech continues to win, like, like this time last year, Tech was around the same spot in terms of the AP poll, I think. Maybe a little bit, uh, a little bit higher in the net rankings, but Tech took care of business and won the ACC tournament, and and everybody started to pay attention. And um, you know, big one on on Thursday, big one on Sunday. You got a week off after that, but I mean, if Tech can go two and zero and really stretch that lead in the ACC, I think people will continue to start paying attention to them. Duke coming up on Thursday. Uh, they welcome them inside Castle Coliseum. It's kind of the same recipe as last year. The last loss that they had before the Final Four was on the road at Cameron Indoor Stadium uh, against Duke. Never lost again in ACC play. What is it going to take to beat the Blue Devils this time around? Obviously, Georgia gets hurt in the second half of that game, but Tech was already kind of on the ropes at that point before Georgia goes out, and it, it really came down to the physical play against Liz Kitley. Tech's got to stay composed. That's something that Tech did not do in that Duke game. Duke, I mentioned the Massey ratings. Duke is the second best defense in the country. Really gets after you, presses, makes life difficult. And and what Tech has to be able to do is kind of weather that storm, understand it. I think having a sold-out Castle Coliseum, 8,900 people, I think that will really help. But it's staying composed and also... If you turn the ball over, if you don't necessarily have, um, if you, t I don't want to say take a bad shot, but if you don't make a basket, don't let that impact your defense. I think too many times in that first meeting uh, when Duke beat Tech pretty handily down in Cameron Indoor, Tech let the game get away from them. Tech led at halftime, and Duke came out with this fire. A and Tech has to match that intensity. Tech has to lock in on the defensive end. I think this team is miles, miles better defensively <clears throat> now than it was last time it played Duke. It's got to show up on that end of the floor, but also just maintain composure. We saw Tech um, take quite a beating uh, against Boston College on Sunday, but Tech didn't really let that impact them. You know, BC tried to muck up the game. Duke tries to do that too, but is way more efficient at it and, and has better players. It's gonna. It's just gonna take maintaining composure, and um, I think you know the game really turned last time when George Amor went out, 
having George A. Moore healthy. She and, and she and Elizabeth Kitley are, are just so dynamic. And I think Duke did a really good job of limiting them. It's going to take contributions from everybody. I, I think this is honestly a completely different team. Um, like, I, And my Duke preview will be out uh, later today one, after the podcast drops. Um, but when you look at these teams on the surface, they're almost identical to where they were before. Tech went into that uh, Duke game. They had just Tech had just lost to the Florida State, but had won a bunch before. Duke had won a couple, lost a couple, a little bit hit or miss. Duke is eight and four, um, right around fifth, I think, in the ACC standings. And Duke has won a couple, lost a couple. Tech's obviously on this run, but when you dive into it a little bit, this Virginia Tech team is is much different because of the way it's rebounding, the way it's playing defense. I, I think that gets Tech over the hump. I think it's good that Tech played Boston College the game before Duke. I mean, Boston College came in and tried to turn it into an MMA fight, and Virginia Tech is going to face that same physicality uh, in, in the Duke game, of course. So uh, I, I think it'll be good. I, I swear, you know, I went to WWE SmackDown on Friday night. I swear <laughs> I saw better clotheslines on yeah. Sunday than I did on Friday. It was that type of game. So it, it's like, go back to like when Paul Johnson was coaching Georgia Tech football. I always wanted Virginia Tech to schedule Navy or Army in a non-conference game to get that extra week of practice early in the season against pretty much the same offense, so you're more prepared for Georgia Tech later in the season. So I, I think it's good that Virginia Tech played Boston College so recently, and they, they turn around and face, not saying the exact style of play, but a f- similar physicality. Which officials were more clueless, the ones in the WWE or the ones that <laughs> called Kayla King for a foul while she was sitting on the ground <sighs> nursing, a, nursing an injured ankle and somebody ran into her? That, 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 that rough WWE has Charles Robinson. He was on like Nitro when I watched it in the 90s. He's been around for a while. He's like... Uh, uh, he's like the Jamie Lucky or Teddy Valentine of WWE. <laughs> Ted Valentine. <laughs> That's a funny comparison. Um, you know, Kenny was pretty frustrated after that Boston College win about the physicality, the lack of calls, uh, and how Liz Kitley just gets so beat up. He kind of went to bat for her, right? If you get a chance, check it out, people. Nick Brown, uh, who's producing today, just put together a great little piece uh, about three to five minutes, Nick. Um, on, on that whole thing, some quotes from Kenny, some some footage, and, and he breaks it all down for us. So if you get a chance, definitely be sure to check that out. Don't want to look too far ahead, but we're not going to talk to everybody until then, uh, until after this game is played on the road at number 18, Louisville. What do the cards bring to the table, uh, David? This is a rematch of the ACC championship game from last year, which is kind of crazy. Um, Notre uh, Louisville is in the same pot as Notre Dame and Syracuse and Boston College and Pitt, I believe. So Tech only plays those teams once every year. Last year, they played in Castle, Tech beat them, and then Tech swept the season series when it won the second time in March in the AC tournament. Tech only plays them once this year, and it's in Louisville. Uh, th- this is a very, very good Cardinals team that does not necessarily have a go-to score, not, a, not necessarily a number one, um, not, no star. I think Haley Van Lith was kind of that for them. She's no longer there, obviously. But this is a Louisville team that is ferocious defensively. I think a lot of people will remember the way Tech played in those two games. Louisville's very, very, very good defensively. Jeff Walls is a very, very good coach. He's the highest paid coach in the ACC for a reason, and he's probably the most successful coach in the ACC for a reason. His teams are always well prepared. That's a really good environment Tech's walking into. This is a big game in terms of the ACC standings and what it means because Louisville is kind of right there on, on Tech's tail, right behind Syracuse. Tech has a good opportunity. Obviously, can't look too far ahead at, you know, past Duke, but that game on Sunday, again, big stakes. You only play once. You have to you have to get a good result. And um, to Tech's credit, when it went to Syracuse, it won that one. Now it has Louisville. It'll have Notre Dame uh, in about uh, a week and a half after the Louisville game on the road. Tech has to take care of business if it wants to kind of maintain that that little bit of cushion in the ACC standings. Well, you talk about the ACC standings. We'll take it there and t- look big picture a little bit. Virginia Tech top of the ACC, 11-2 and two, uh, in conference play. Syracuse right behind them, 10-3. and three. NC State and Louisville right behind that, each at 9-3. and three. Notre Dame's next, 8-4. and four. Duke is there at 8-4. and four. And then it's Florida State, Carolina, Miami. 
and so on. Uh, I know that when we talked before the show, you wanted to kind of take a look at Syracuse's upcoming schedule and Louisville's upcoming schedule. Uh, the Orange play on the road at Miami. Uh, they play at Virginia. They host Duke. They host Pitt. And then they end in Reynolds Coliseum on the road at NC State. So they have a tough stretch of their own. They just beat Louisville. Uh, that split a season series between Louisville and Syracuse. So that is why Syracuse has that little bit of an advantage there when it comes to a tiebreaker scenario. Can you explain to us, David, how important these next handful of games are for Tech because they can really solidify not only the fact that they're the top team in the ACC, but if tiebreakers come in effect, they kind of own a tiebreaker over everybody but Louisville up to this point, and they have a chance at that now. Yeah, the the one team that Tech has played in, in those five top five or six teams that doesn't have a tiebreaker over is, is Duke. Florida State's right behind it. Tech lost those two games. Those are Tech's only two ACC losses. Tech has Duke on Thursday, has a chance to, to split. The way the tiebreakers work in, in both men's and women's basketball is if you are tied with the team, it goes to head-to-head. Well, obviously, Tech has beaten a lot of teams head-to-head. It's beaten Syracuse. It has swept NC State 2 and 0 against the Wolfpack. It has beaten North Carolina, not lost to Duke, but it has the chance to even that up. If you split, it goes to your record against the top team in the standing. So if it's the two teams for the top place, then it goes to your record against the next team. So say Virginia Tech and uh, and. and uh, Duke are, are tied for the top place in the ACC standings, um, and Syracuse is the third place team. Well, if Duke lost to Syracuse and Virginia Tech beat Syracuse, Tech would be the number one seed, so to speak. It doesn't necessarily matter in terms of the actual standings um, because you know they allow ties, they allow co-champions, you know, share the regular season title. But when it comes to to seeding in terms of the ACC tournament, um, and I've been keeping up with that. Um, obviously, Tech's the one seed right now. It's it's all important, and Tech has a chance to again get back even with Duke, and then to get one over Louisville. If so, it'll have a tiebreaker over everybody except for Notre Dame, who it then plays in about a week and a half. So, again, Tech has put itself in such such a good spot. Unfortunately, isn't necessarily getting a, a ton of the na- national recognition it probably deserves, but. I think that'll change soon. And if Tech continues to take care of business, th- this is a team that will will be in in business. Um, you know, come these final couple of weeks, come the AZ tournament. I think the most important thing, and and I probably should have mentioned this before we went on, Geo. These are top twenty five games. So I actually got some clarification on on the women and the net rankings. They don't have quadrants, but they have. I'll call them uh, column. I don't columns or or categories. I guess, um, but you know, it's kind of similar. One through twenty five, twenty six through fifty, and so on. And I've been keeping track of that. They're just not. And it doesn't matter if it's home or on the road. Correct. Yeah. yeah it, and and that's just. And I actually got some clarification for some people from the AC, NCAA about this. Um, but so again, it's it's a little bit different situation. Than the men, who obviously it factors in home and away, and that's up to the NCAA tournament committee's uh, decision to to do it like this. But these next two games are teams. Tech plays teams that are top twenty-five. These are games. If you want to have a chance to be a top seed in the NCAA tournament, you have to win these. And I think Tech will really, really be up for the Duke game. I think the Castle Coliseum crowd will be up for the Duke oh, yeah. game. Uh, and, and then you got to go to Louisville, and and you got to show what you've been able to do on the road this year, which is Tech has gone into places like Syracuse, North Carolina, NC State, three straight ranked wins on the road. Can Tech do it again against Louisville? What What, what is the crowd like uh, at Louisville for women's hoops? You know that it can be hostile at, you know, Carmichael Arena, Reynolds Coliseum. Syracuse had their best crowd of the year for women's basketball against Virginia Tech. What can you expect at the Yum Center against a ranked Louisville squad? Uh, it's a good crowd. I'm actually going to pull up uh, Louisville's a- average attendance this year. Again, the Yum Center is such a big arena. I mean, it hosts you know, NCAA tournament regionals. Close and to 30,000 people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it is, it's huge, but at the same time, so it's like, Louisville doesn't sell it out, but Louisville has a really, really good crowd. Now it's probably like a place like Syracuse where if, you know, it could have a good crowd, but it's hard to tell. It might be hard to tell sometimes because the arena is so Cavernous. huge. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Louisville's had, 
some really, really good attendance this year. Let's hope this uh, – nope, Louisville's stats don't – have it up anyway. Louisville's Louisville's had really good attendance. It's gonna be a good it's gonna be a good crowd. Um, I, I want to say Louisville's led the ACC in attendance in the last handful of years. Wow, now, it's obviously a little bit easier because it has such a big arena. Um, expect a good crowd. This is a, a really really good Louisville team that will probably want revenge for what happened last year. Um, you know, Tech played really well against Louisville here. It came down to the wire. Tech played really well against Louisville and Greensboro. That one came down to the wire. And if you remember, there was a little bit of physicality, a little bit of bumping and banging. Um, and Tech fans were not happy with that. Tech is going to have to lock in and, and just kind of be smart and mentally sound. And honestly, that's kind of what impressed me the most about the win against Boston College the other day. Not, not necessarily a flashy and impressive win because Boston College is a team about... 90th in the net rankings but in those types of games where you're getting banged and and bumped and elbowed in the head and getting called for a foul when you're laying on the floor grabbing your ankle like you you have to you can't let it impact you you can't let it get to you and tech didn't and tech hasn't really since that duke game and that's going to be the challenge on thursday can't let it affect you when you go on the road you can't let it affect you at louisville um, tech has been good in that area. Can it, can it keep it going? Because I think that will kind of um, that'll be that'll be key as we kind of get into this final stretch. Last thing on women's basketball here: new commitment for the Hokies for next year. Amelia Hassett, another yeah. Australian, she'll come in as a junior, a six three forward uh, from Eastern Florida State, a JUCO product, average nineteen points, thirteen rebounds uh, this past season. David, what do you know about her, and what does she bring to the table for Tech? Lo- uh, one sec. Okay, so Louisville averages eighty two hundred fans a game. So it's that, pretty good. That's, a, that's good. Just that's just to let you very know. Very good. Uh, Amelia Hassett. Uh, she's a a JUCO from Eastern Florida State. She's an Australian. Another one of the Aussies. Six three forward. Uh, she averages nineteen and thirteen. She's a really really good prospect. Um, she'll come in as a junior. She played two years of JUCO ball. She has experience playing semi pro in Australia and playing. Um, with some of the youth national teams. She gives Virginia Tech uh, some depth there at that four spot. Um, Maya Hazelton comes in in the recruiting class, and she'll be a freshman next year. And I, I believe Rose, Rose, you know, Rose Mishaw will still be here unless she, for some reason, transfers out. Um, and obviously, Clary Strax played a lot of the four at, at times this year. But So that gives Tech a, another another body at that spot. And she's not she's somebody that's not afraid to necessarily step out and stretch the floor. So she's a really good three-point shooter. I think she's shooting above 40% on like, I want to say on like 70 or 80 attempts. So she she is exactly, I think, what Tech needs. Kenny Brooks has been good about finding some of these diamonds in the rough, so to speak. Um Seems to find him in Australia a lot, doesn't he? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> Taylor Emery, um, you know, who played for Virginia Tech at the beginning of the Kenny Brooks era, she was a, a, a JUCO transfer, and she was fantastic. DeAsia Gregg, a lot of people would remember her. She eventually came into her own last year in her third season with Virginia Tech, but she was a JUCO transfer. Um, Trinity Baptiste is another one. He has excelled in in turning a lot of these JUCO kids, you know, getting them to the ACC and, and letting them succeed and, and putting them in roles to do so. And I think Hassett will be a really, really good pickup. Obviously it doesn't impact tech this year, um, but she's talented. And next year it'll be interesting to, to see how the lineup shakes out. Obviously tech has a Clara Silva six, seven center. Uh, so you, you know, you could play a six, four cent forward and Strack and a six, seven center and, uh, and that, Silva together. That, that's like the men's team having like a seven, three center. Yeah, yeah, that, that's and insane. she's uh, you know, as Kenny Brooks told us, uh, w- when they signed all the kids back in November or December, you know, she was an American recruit because she's from Portugal. She'd be like a top ten recruit in the country. She's very, very talented, um, but I think Hassett will be an asset. How about that? Yes. I like that. I like that. Good way to transition here. As always, Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. As our presenting sponsor, First Bank and Trust Company's support has been invaluable to TSL, helping us to bring you all the great content across all of our platforms. Who you choose to bank with can make all the difference. Bank with First Bank 
and trust company. Visit firstbank.com to learn more. Shifting gears now to men's basketball. Chris, I want to bring it to you. Lost on Saturday to Notre Dame for Virginia Tech, but a bounce back win last night over Florida State. Game felt like it was going to go on forever. A late one in the castle. Of course, it was a 9 o'clock game, and, and it was close most of the game. So you're like, uh, watch this go to like overtime, and everybody gets home at 1 a.m. Now, granted, David got home at 3 a.m. because he was... No, I got I went home and finished work at home. Okay. I got home about 1.30. You, you finished working at 3 a.m. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and here he is doing his due diligence today. Hey. Probably should go take a nap after this. But uh, I thought it was a good bounce back. I thought, you know, Notre Dame was a bad loss, obviously. But uh, Tech played well last night. Tech has played well twice against Florida State this year. They, they outplayed Florida State for about 85% of that first meeting. It was that stretch where Florida State grabbed about eight offensive rebounds in the course of just a minute or two that really turned that game on its head. But Virginia Tech has outplayed Florida State for the vast majority of, of, of the, their two meetings. Uh Florida State's, you know, they look the part. that They have good athletes, but Virginia Tech has out-basketballed them this year when, when, when they've played. You know, there was one point I was watching the game with the mustache man last night, and he pointed out to me at one point, Florida State had a one-and-one one in that game. And they didn't have anybody under the basket for a rebound because Leonard Hamilton had them all over on the bench talking to them. So the refs are kind of like, okay, well, you just they don't have players here. So he just gave the ball to the shooter to shoot. He missed. It was just all tech players under the basket. It was like Florida State. It was like Hamilton didn't even realize it was a one and one. He thought it was two free throws. So if that's the case, then like how much is he really? I mean, he's 75 years old. How much is he into it anymore? Uh, it will be he'll be joining Bayheim at the at the desk sooner rather than later. Um, but, you know, I thought tech, tech played well. Um, they're six and seven in the ACC. They're just like any other middle of the pack team. You can, you can win or lose just about any game you play, and there's not necessarily going to be a rhyme or reason to it. Um, you know, Tech played poorly against Notre Dame, but at the and Notre Dame's a bad team. But at the same time, like UVA got drilled there. Well, they <laughs> lose drilled. by like twenty or thirty. It was bad. Yeah, I mean, it's, it happens. Um, Overall, my, my thoughts on this team are not any different than they were six weeks ago. So they, they, they lack guard depth. They did play more guys last night. It was good to see Young get out there and make a contribution. And I thought he played pretty well. He he held up well against the press. I thought he was maybe stronger the ball, with the ball against the press than maybe anybody else outside of uh, Couture. Got big contributions from Nickel again. I think he's playing pretty well for the Hokies offensively. Um, a tough stretch, tough stretch coming up, though. A game below 500 in ACC play. Uh, David, you mentioned they're kind of what they're playing for right now is that uh, single round bye in the ACC tournament that that allows you to play on Wednesday instead of Tuesday. How big can that be? Because you're in a, a situation now where you might have to go on a little bit of a run and make something happen uh, in the ACC tournament. Yeah, I mean, I think anytime you can avoid playing on Tuesday in the ACC tournament is a bonus. Um, Right now, Tech is the 11 seed, so Tech's in in that situation. But um, yeah, Tech has a lot of opportunities to get wins, and I know some people are already done with the season. And, and that Notre Dame loss was a bad loss. Um, I ran the numbers. Tech has in Mike in the Mike Young era. You look at the the, the losses and how bad they are. Um, Tech lost to two Boston College teams that were about the same Ken Palm rating, about 170 as Notre Dame. Tech lost to a Georgia Tech team that was about 160. Now, these are uh, in, in the past handful of years. Um, you know, Notre Dame's right up there. It was not a good loss at all, not a good game. But um, but Tech has a big stretch coming up. until Tech can still make something out of the season. And I think that's what I saw last night. Um, it Tech had lost three straight games, and I thought when Tech needed to, to step on it and and come out with energy and play physical and match that, it did in the second half. I think the play of the game was the alley-oop to start the second half from oh, Sean yeah. Padula to Lynn Kidd. It got the crowd back into it. Um, it gave everybody energy. And in a game like that, Florida State is so long, so physical. I mean – I saw pictures from our photographer, John Fleming, after the game, and guys are getting hit in the face. And, like, I put one of my story of MJ Collins where, like, there's an arm, like, across his entire body. And, like, 
you have to be able to play through contact and understand that. So I, I think that was a, a, a win that Tech desperately needed, obviously. But Tech puts itself in, in a good position to make a little bit of a run here. And you want to play on Wednesday in Greensboro because that means you're one step closer to playing on Thursday. And that's where if you want any chance to 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 do anything in the postseason, you know, that's where you're going to find the good teams. You're not going to necessarily play them on on Wednesday when – you're playing, uh, you know, say you're the eight or nine seed. You're playing the other eight or nine seed. And then you have to go play the one, right? You're, or if you're the seven seed, you're playing somebody in between the ten and fifteen range. You know, there's three. The you're talking about the threes through the sixes. Those, yeah, you yeah. you've got to you like we you 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 mentioned that you wanted to bring it up. Virginia Tech's resume, um, as of yesterday, in of the Teams in the top 100 of the net, Virginia Tech was one of nine that have played nine, sorry, 10 Quadrant One games this year. Mm -hmm. In the past, the reason I bring it up is because in the past, Tech has not necessarily had those opportunities. The ACC has not been as good. I think the ACC is better this year. Tech has also scheduled pretty well out of conference. Tech has had opportunities. It just hasn't necessarily taken advantage of them. But it has two more big opportunities coming up. North Carolina on the road. Virginia at home. Wake Forest is looking like a really good team. Pitt and Syracuse both won last night. Uh, those are big games coming up. Like Tech can still make something out of the season. Now, again, it's going to be a long shot and a long haul. and That's what happens when you put yourself in this kind of position. But... Um, all things considered, Tech has played a really tough schedule, and and those are kind of the games that make or break whether you're going to the big dance or not. Yeah, it's a tougher schedule than, than usual. I mean, there's just not that many teams above Tech in the net that have played as many or more quad one games. Besides the top three teams right, in the right, country. Right, right. It's like uh, Tech, it hadn't been like a top-heavy schedule per se with like a bunch of top 10, bunch of top 15 teams, obviously. But but as far as your quad one opponents go, very few teams in the country in the country have played as many quad one teams as, as Virginia Tech has, and that's uh, you know quad one games are quad one games for a reason. They're, they're tougher games. Uh, as far as the loss to Notre Dame, again, you know being a bad loss. Mike Young averaged was one of those per year, basically through his, his tenure. But that's no different than anybody else. Like like Georgia Tech has beaten UNC and Duke, right? So it's it's not. The Notre Dame game, per se, it's Tech not being quite good enough in those other games as much as anything. It's about not quite finishing off Miami in either one of those or meetings. Or Florida State. It's not holding on to the Florida State lead. Um, it's losing to South Carolina by two uh, towards, towards the beginning of the season. Um, like, everybody, almost everybody's going to have what's, con what's conceived as a bad loss um, or what's perceived as a bad loss. Uh, a bad loss doesn't doesn't necessarily, you know, break you. Um, Virginia Tech is fourteen and ten. They could have done better in those other games. They, they easily could have, and still lost to Notre, Notre Dame, and they'd be in a much better position. Yeah, but because you know they would have had, you know, at Florida State would have been a quad one win, right? Um, Tech is fourteen and ten, and I think when, when I watch them. You try not to you try not to look at any any individual game and say oh they look great this game or they look horrible this game. Take the twenty four games that you've seen and make your determination. And they look about like a fourteen and, and they look 10 an team. average team. Yeah. yeah, and again, Tech Tech yesterday was three and seven in Q one games, ten losses. So seven of your ten losses are Q one. Mm -hmm. Like that determine again that determines the outcome of your season. Coming up on Saturday, Virginia Tech heads to Chapel Hill to take on North Carolina. Andy, are you tagging along for the road trip for that one? I'm I'm covering it. Nice. Uh, oh, Dave, so I'm going to Louisville. Yeah, You're going, going to Louisville. Awesome. Uh, nice. So yeah, I, I, just to jump in the discussion they were having. I mean, you look at that Notre Dame loss, and I feel like they'll be kicking themselves, especially in terms of tournament seating at the end of the year. I feel like if, if there's a, a cardinal rule on the ACC there this year, quite literally, it's don't lose to the Louisville Cardinals. <laughs> uh, and if there's a 1B to that rule, it's don't lose at Notre Dame because they're pretty bad too. They lost seven straight coming to that game. And you look at the standings of this and you say they're the 11th seed right now, Virginia Tech. The five seed is one game ahead of them. 
I mean, you look look at how tightly bunched this the standings are. Pitt, NC State, Florida State, all seven and six. Clemson, six and six. You know, Clemson's like an, an an NCAA tournament team based on where their net rankings are and everything like that. They're six and six in the ACC. Syracuse, seven and seven, and then Miami and Virginia Tech at six and seven. Uh, I mean, you talk about losing close games against Miami, Florida State, like that. But man, you got to win that one against Notre Dame. That was just such a bad loss to a team that had lost seven straight uh, coming into it. I feel like. Tournament seeding wise, that's one you kick yourself at the end of the year that you can't go and win a game like that. They still have uh, Notre Dame at home, I believe, and Louisville at the end of the year, so maybe a chance to to pad some wins there. But they didn't really need to make some hay in these next five games against quality competition uh, to get that seeding. Uh, and I, the other thought I had was what I was curious what everybody thought of uh, Florida State's turquoise uniforms Ugh. last night. They're Very strange. Well, it's, weird. I, it, well, it's like Seminoles appreciate. It's like a Seminole Native American yeah, like. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. It's celebration, it's like it's, it's a color in Native American culture. I kind of like it. It's, I like it's it. like it's like uh, those soccer teams in Europe where they're like, ah, oh, our colors are red and black. And what do you wear on the road in this game? Orange. But like just randomly, of, just the, they have a third alternate. <laughs> yeah, uniform that weird color they're they wear yeah. on the road. Yeah. Like I kind of like that. I think Virginia Tech should just take up a, a random color on the road. I always like, liked when Tech wore like the like, like gray or. Yeah, I got no issue with gray. Gray was like originally one of Virginia. Gray is not that's not weird enough to wear like gray or black. <laughs> no. You gotta be like we're wearing uh, green on the road yeah, for this. True. Like that's our road uniform color this year is green, <laughs> just randomly. Yeah. I, I like it. I like the blue. I, it, it looks like Coastal Carolina colors. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. 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 And he mentioned Andy mentioned the Notre Dame game um, specifically about that. I think these last two games, Tech hasn't necessarily been as good defensively. Agreed. Um, I think that's why Tech lost that Notre Dame game. I thought Tech has done a good job of getting Hunter Couture more shots. Yesterday against Boston College was the first time he had scored 20 points this season, which is crazy to think about because he's averaging almost 15. Right. But he just hasn't gotten over that 20-point yeah. Um Tech's doing a, a good job on offense, I think, needs to do a better job on defense. These last two games, Florida State shot 61% in the first half, regressed to about 54%, but Tech won that game because it, it won the rebounding battle. At Notre Dame, Tech couldn't play defense for the life of it. And I know Marcus Burton, you know, he's a 5'11 point guard, leads the ACC freshman in scoring uh, for Notre Dame. He's really shifty and quick and, and bursts around screen, so he's tough to corral, but... Tech just kind of looked out of it on that end of the floor. But I thought Florida State was a good bounce back win. Like like Andy said, you got to have the Notre Dame game. Um, but Tech has opportunities here. Like, you know, North Carolina Saturday, just lost to Syracuse. Virginia Monday, just lost to Pitt. Then you got Pitt and then Syracuse. Virginia's lost three in a row in Castle. Yeah, and Carolina's lost three of their last five altogether. Yeah, so it's like, you know, it's not it's not impossible. It's not easy, but <laughs> but like, I don't know. Again, I, I think I kind of agree with Chris. This is kind of an, a team that's about average and is playing about that. And it's hit or miss, and you know, who knows what team what team is going to show up. I will say, you know, Chris mentioned the Brandon Rexner and the Jaden Young, John Camden. I thought all three of those guys played some really really big minutes. You have to against Florida State with a team that plays 11 plus guys, you have to be able to play your depth. Mike Young did that. You saw some freshman mistakes from a guy like Brandon Rexner, but you also saw him hit a deep three. You also saw Jaden Young hit a three. I thought he was good. Mm -hmm. I thought John Camden came in. He should have had a three. Thought it was going to get down, but it lipped out. But he hit two clutch free throws, coming in cold off the bench. Like, Tech got contributions from those guys. I think not having Makai Long hurts in a game like that. Um, I thought it would until Tech crushed them on the boards. That's what we need to talk well, about. Yeah, well, but I but I think de- I mean like in terms of having an experienced body, sure, that yeah. that's where I think you you miss a guy like Makai Long because uh, I think Tech did okay, but I was a little worried like for Tech when you know Robbie Barron goes out with fouls and it's like who are you turn to? You're turning John Camden. He's barely played this year. He did a good job. Kudos to him, but. Makai Long would be so helpful to have in that situation. No doubt. All right. I want to ask. It would be nice uh, if they put on a show at UNC. Just make it like a good game. Just in honor so of you me. Have something good to write In about? honor of me going down there and covering. This will be my first game covering a game at North Carolina, a basketball game in 17 years. Wow. Wow. Uh, wow. Going down there. What was the last one? 
Uh, that's when I was covering UVA. Okay. Uh, it was a UVA uh, UNC game. I think UVA was up in the first half, and then was UNC Tony came storming back. That was still the Dave Lato era. Oh, wow. the, I, the, I, there was also a Virginia Tech North Carolina game, the last game I covered between these two schools. Care to take a guess which one it was? The 2006 7 game? Uh, it was a pretty uh, historic game. It was the uh, AD not oh foul my, game. Oh, duh. Oh, that's uh, right. When, when he wrote right. that. Tyler Hansborough game? Yeah, he wrote that mm. on my notepad, by uh, the way. Right. I was in the front row uh, and then in the media row. And I was not covering Virginia Tech at that time, but he chose my notepad for some reason to write on that. If you can ever find that thing, it needs to be framed. I, I had it for a while, and I think in one of my, like, six moves since I lived in Lynchburg, like, it got lost in the shuffle somewhere. So, in the trash bin of history, unfortunately, with that. But that was uh, that was the last Virginia Tech-UNC game that wow. I attended was AD not foul. That's crazy. That's really cool there. Um, wanted to ask you, David, real quick, just because, again, just like the Louisville situation where the women were not going to see everybody until then, UVA coming up, big Monday. What can we expect out of the Cavs? Different scenario here because we already played them once. If Virginia Tech makes its three-pointers, Tech will win. Is that an outlandish statement? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Virgi- Vir- Virginia got torched on, on Tuesday night by UVA. Or Virginia Pitt. got torched by Pitt, yes. yes. Thank you. Um, Pitt's a really good three-point shooting team. This is UVA has been the hottest team in the ACC until last night. Um, I think Tech is in a little tough spot with Carolina because Carolina is coming off a loss. But UVA, I believe, has a game on Saturday but before Monday. Again, Virginia Tech has won the last three against Tony Bennett and Virginia in Castle Coliseum. I think this is a matchup that Virginia Tech played pretty well. Uh, in in Charlottesville, in John Paul Jones Arena, the problem was that Jordan Minor absolutely dominated Lynn Kidd on the inside. Lynn Kidd and Melajda Poteet have to have a good game on the inside. Mm-hmm. They have to have that presence. Because I thought, if you remember, that was Hunter Couture's first game back from injury. Right. I thought Hunter Couture defended really well. Uh, Isaac McNeely and Reese Beekman, uh, he and MJ Collins. I thought they did a good job on those guys. Um Tech has to be better on the interior this time around. But that's a UVA team that you know what you're going to get defensively. It's going to be a slow game. It's going to be methodical. UVA's playing really well defensively too. But honestly, I like what I've seen from Tech offensively. I think the looks are pretty good. Maybe too many turnovers, but you could always... I mean, that's been a theme all year. Um, but, But if Tech... I mean, if Tech uses the crowd to its advantage and plays good defense, specifically on the interior, I think it'll have a good night on Monday. Let's go around the horn here. What's coming up on TSL this week? Because we're getting into that crazy season again, softball, lacrosse, baseball, wrestling, wrapping up. I mean, everything's going on. You know, I wrote uh, an article yesterday about some early targets for the 2025 recruiting class, and uh, tomorrow I'll do uh, a similar article for for defensive prospects. Uh, Friday I'll have a Q&A, as usual, as well, and – David's busy because Just a little uh, bit. yeah. Um yeah, I'm uh I will have a I'm by the time this podcast is up I should have a my Duke my Duke preview out and I'm right I got a basketball Q&A that's in the works that should be out later today as well. Uh, I believe Sam Mostow. He he sat down and interviewed Rachel Castine uh Virginia Tech softball. She had Four home runs in Virginia Tech's opening weekend, including two grand slams. She was the D1 softball national player of the week. Decent weekend. Uh, he sat down with her today. I believe he's going to have a kind of a short feature on her. Um, we've got a lot of stuff coming up tomorrow. Uh, Raza Umar- U- Umarani, yes, who's, sir. Go- who's going down to Charlotte to cover baseball for us this weekend. He will have a, a Charlotte preview either today or tomorrow. My guess is tomorrow. Chip Grubb will have a softball preview. I believe he was leaving to go to Arizona today. So we'll have Chip on site in Arizona. Roz will be on site in Charlotte. Andy will be on site in Chapel Hill. I'll be on site in Louisville. We're, we're, we're very, very, very busy. Worldwide. And that's not even yeah. to mention. TSL worldwide. That's not even to mention. Uh, we got wrestling, too. Wrestling has, uh, is at Pitt. Uh, Jack Brizendine will not be there, I don't believe. But, uh, but yeah, TSL worldwide. I will say two points about softball. Chip has an insane amount of energy. I saw him on the big screen last night at a 9 o'clock game, and today he's traveling to Arizona. Uh, second of all, how about Auburn getting the refs to stop that game last week? What was it, 9-5? Nine, nine to five It was 9-5 to five in the seventh in the inning. inning. And it had rained. The field was covered in tarp. And the, the umps call the game after uh, some uh, 
consultation with Auburn. And uh, so it reverts so to it a reversed, five, five reverts tie. the six inning, a five, five tie. And then it didn't rain a drop after the game was called, of course, because you could, you could look at a radar and tell that it wasn't going to. But anyway, so yeah, Virginia Tech won undefeated, but they actually should probably have one more Very win. Very good weekend for them. It was. Yeah. All right, Andy, what's coming up for you? Uh, we're finalizing a, a Virginia Tech football fan survey to sort of take the temperature of the fan base right now just to see how unreasonable some of the takes are going to be this offseason. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what it's like. If uh, people keep a level head about that, they get ahead of themselves a little bit. I think you uh, know what it's going to yeah, be. Yeah, I know. I can't <laughs> wait to see the, the results on that. Uh, at, at North Carolina, I'll be covering uh, basketball this week. Helping out David on Monday as well with a UVA game. We'll, we'll double cover that. Uh, and also, I think there's some football stuff coming next week. Still working on finalizing, putting the finishing touches on some interview requests and such. But I think there's a lot of football stuff coming down the pike. Yeah. It's going to be a next week's going to be big. UVA on, on Big Monday. Monday's going to be a long day. Monday, Let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> UVA on, on Big Monday. I'll be traveling back from, from Louisville. Uh, Andy's going to help me cover that one. That'll be after covering the Louisville game on, on Sunday. Andy will have the men's coverage on, on Saturday. The women have, are off next week. They've got their open week. They don't play on Thursday. Uh, and then they'll, they're will they back in business against Carolina on Sunday. And that's a sold-out game, too. So uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff going on next week. It's going to be very, 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 very busy time of year. It's a good time to subscribe. Absolutely. I think that's uh, going to put a bow on it for today. Thanks so much for hanging out with us for episode 347 of the Tech Sideline Podcast. Enjoy all the games coming up uh, this weekend, and we'll see you next week. For Nick Brown, for Andy Bitter, for David Cunningham, for Chris Coleman, I'm Giovanni Heater saying so long.